Good morning, and we want to say a warm spring uh, day welcome to you all, and uh, trust that your day is starting with uh, hopefully a little more sunshine than we've got here right now, but we want to welcome you and thank you for attending the uh, FS, FASD learning session. I'll just take a moment to introduce myself. I'm uh, Vic Peterson, and I work with Alberta Education. I am a member of the uh, FASD Cross Ministry Committee. Our theme for this year is prevention, and we opened the season with a presentation by Nancy Poole, who challenged us to think about uh, what we know about prevention and whether we're actually doing it. Today, Vanessa Buckskin and Michelle Weaselhead Strangling Wolf will discuss the use of family-centered parent-child assistance program model in First Nations communities. Now, before I introduce Vanessa and Michelle, there are a few housekeeping tips. You can ask questions during the presentation by using the question and answer module on the right hand side of your screen. A session facilitator is monitoring the questions and will pose them at suitable times during the live presentation. And if we're unable to answer them during the presentation, we will answer them via email after the session is over. It's important that you include your email address so when you ask your question so we know who to send the response to. Our presenter's contact information will be found on the final slide of the presentation. And in order to receive your certificate of attendance, you must have signed in after 8.50 a.m. this morning. Evaluations for this session will be emailed to you after the session and we do hope that you'll fill them out and return them. We rely on that feedback to continually improve what we do and how we do it. Today's presentation and handouts will be posted for viewing and downloading on the FASD Alberta website. And that's at fasd.alberta.ca. If you experience any technical issues, please, please email support at cmgcanada.ca or you may want to check at, uh, with your local tech to ensure that the problem may not be originating at your end. As Alberta advances with the FASD 10-year strategic plan, education and training continue to play a key role. This is our fifth year of offering sessions and our second year of delivering them via um, the online and through the uh, webinars. As always, the sessions are taped and made available on the CMC website, and we're pleased with the ongoing interest and attendance in this initiative. We appreciate the work of CASA, Child Adolescent Family Mental Health, and the Alberta Centre for Child Family and Community Research in making this whole initiative a success. Now, I have the privilege of introducing Vanessa and Michelle. Vanessa Buckskin is the FASD Clinic Coordinator for the six Sika Health Services under the Community Wellness Programs. Her experience includes eight years working in the area of FASD and programming. Previous to her current employment, she was the program co coordinator for a PCAP program operating out of the Blood Tribe. First steps for healthy babies, and she has worked in various work experiences in the human service field. Her involvement in the field of FASD has been a passionate journey of intervention, prevention, and overall development with First Nations communities. She received her Bachelor of Health Service Sciences, sorry, specializing in addictions counseling from the University of Lethbridge in 2005. Michelle Weaselhead Strangling Wolf is the FASD resource support worker, mentor for the Siksika Health Services. Her role with the program includes advocate, facilitator, and support for individuals diagnosed or suspected of having FASD within and around the Siksika Nation. Her previous work experience includes community health representative, Portage College in 1998, and recreational leader, Mount Royal College, 2001. Her passion is within the FASD field and community wellness programs based on her traditional and contemporary beliefs and values. Please join me in welcoming Vanessa and Michelle.
Hi, so thank you for that warm welcome. Again, my name is Vanessa Buxkin. I am the clinic coordinator for the FASD program with, under Sixaga Health Services. Um, I've been there probably for about two and a half years now, running the FASD program along with the clinical services um, with the multidisciplinary team. Um, I have my colleague with me, Michelle Weaselhead, who will be speaking with me um, during the presentation to share her experience with um, the clients she mentors along with her programming and facilitation. So we're just going to kind of begin with a brief overview of um, the nation, Sixaga Nation, where we present this program in, um, and then we'll go along through there. So um, the logo on the right hand side is the FASD logo for our program. And I just kind of want to point out that this, this logo was developed by one of the children involved in our program who has been diagnosed with FASD. And it was during one of our support group sessions that she had approached Michelle and kind of told her um, um, she had a, a little baby, that a prop that Michelle had during that session, her learning session with the, the children and the families involved. And she told Michelle um, to look at the baby and how she had um, the power in the palm of her hand. So this is one of our children who was six years of age who actually named our program and gave us a lo the slogan for the program that we present in the community. Um, the image on the other side of that um, logo is the Sixaga House Service logo. So this is ge the general logo that's used under health services. One individual that, another individual that works with us is Tyann Redgun, and she's the clinical assistant and um, a data entry clerk. So she helps me with the whole process with the multidisciplinary team and getting the children ready for the clinics. Oops. Okay. How many communities do I have? <clears throat> so what we're presenting right now is the communities um, that we service within Sixaga. Sixaga is a huge reserve, and there's a lot of tiny little communities within Sixaga. And what we have presented right now is 20 little communities within the nation itself. So we've kind of given a rundown of how many clients we have with it, with, within each community um, that we're providing services for. This has actually increased because we've just had two, two clinics um, that have gone through since this has been updated. So there's about um, six more families that have entered the program. Um, it just gives you an overview of how many programs we, um, communities we have within the Sixaga Nation and how they're broken up within the communities. Um, this is just a general map of the Sixaga Nation. Sixaga is the third largest First Nation community within Alberta, and the current population for that nation is 7,013. Um, with the first, um, the FASD program, we are service, providing services for 54 families. So it's just a small little chunk, but it, when, you, when you look at it in the huger scope of FASD, we, there's only three of us providing services to 54 families. Um, when I say 54, we'd like to actually say that that number doubles because we're not just working with the clients, we're working with families, grandparents and aunt and uncles, uh, foster parents, um, social service workers and the school. So our, 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 our numbers with providing services actually doubles in size, um, but it just kind of gives a general overview of what the services we provide for and who we provide it for, which we'll go into detail in later in the presentation. Okay, so there's three components with the FASD program um, within the Sixaga Nation. Uh, one of the programs that we have right now is providing um, diagnosis for children between the ages of 6 and 12 years old. So we have a full multidisciplinary clinic that is set up within the nation um, that provides um, di possible diagnosis for the children that come through the clinic. Um, when I say mo full multidisciplinary, um, a full multidisciplinary team, I do mean that we do have um, a psychologist on board occupational health, speech and language, um, 
our FASD team and a pedi pediatrician who's on board who um, assists with this whole diagnosis process. Um, the clinic itself is wrapped around the child, which we've indicated in the graph that we have up here, and the family. And the most, our partnership is with Renfrew Educational Services out of Calgary, and they're the ones that actually come out and provide diagnosis for our children, providing the testing for the children. So it's thorough documentation, it's thorough testing, it's a thorough assessment process that's done on the children. We also have a really close partnership with Family, um, Sixaga Family Services, and about 80% of those um, clients that come through the clinic are from um, family service files. The other 20% would be community files. So that would be the school referring to us, the community referring to us, um, any other outside agency referring children to our clinic. We have children come through the clinic between the ages of 6 and 17 years of age. And um, depending on our funding, we do run anywhere from 4 to 6 clinics per year. Um, within one clinic, we have about three children that we diagnose, possible with possibly diagnose. So what we do um, with the whole FASD clinic is we do um, we wrap the services entirely around the child and whoever the caregiver is at the time, whether it's the foster parents, whether it's the biological parents, whether it's the um, grandparents or aunt and uncles, the services are wrapped around that individual. So when we're doing a diagno possible diagnosis, we involve the multi the primary team, which is the multidisciplinary team, which is again the psychologist, the occupational therapist, the speech and language, the pediatrician, and ourselves at Sixaga Health. So that's the primary team. The secondary team is anybody else that's involved with that child's life. So we involve the schools, we involve the social workers, we involve the counselors, we involve um, the alcohol treatment, we involve anything else that is providing support to that individual <clears throat> into this session. So it's a whole, um, it's, it's a wraparound service around this child so that we're providing the best efficient services for this child and they're getting the best quality care that we can provide for them. So when we do do a diagnosis for a child, um, there's a lot of layers, there's a lot of paperwork. It's very thorough because we want to make sure that we are doing um, the best possible care and the best possible diagnosis for this individual. So it's a whole process that we do for them. The second part of it is um, just to kind of, uh, uh, I would say, amending the PCAT program to work for the Sixaga Nation. So we were aware that the PCAP program is very target specific in meaning that it's targeting high risk women. And the whole goal of PCAP is to reduce the consumption of alcohol during pregnancy and then to link up services to this individual so that we're providing that intervention to them. What we've done out in Sixaga and what we've um, experienced and what we're knowing from the community is that we need to involve the family in that whole process. And because we're already have, we already have the child entering the program with the whole clinical process of the, multi the diagnosis and the multidisciplinary team, we've kind of amended this PCAP program to work for our community and the whole family. So we've moved it from child-based centered to family centered. And all we've done is taken the child and who's ever providing that immediate care and the family can be anyone again from the foster parents to the grandparents to the um, bio parents or even any extended family. Whoever this family is providing immediate care for that child is the family for that child. So what we do is we wrap this whole PCAP model around that individual. What we've done in this, in this slide is we've kind of looked at, okay, we need to provide the diagnosis if that child is um, F, um, has possible FASD. We provide the awareness to that individual and the families, the education around the diagnosis, the education around FASD, the teachings around FASD, the parenting around FASD, and then we link them up to services as well. Um, we link them up to educational services, we really link them up to family services, we link them up to anything that will benefit this child is, is what we, our priority is. Um, we develop a case plan um, a case plan that includes the um, diagnosis of the child. So there's a whole beautiful report that comes out when a child is diagnosed and it gives a lot of strengths, it gives a lot of positive feedback. It looks at how this child learns best. We take that report, we 
tear it apart and we put it in a beautiful case plan that actually helps the family. So what we do is we take this case plan and we develop one for the, for the family and for the school. Because we know a lot of these children have a lot of um, behavioral issues in the school as well. And FASD in our community is still, I would say, two steps back. So the teachers are still learning about FASD. The family services workers are still learning about FASD. So we're the people that come in there and tell them, this is how the child learns best. This is what the child, the child is going to learn. And these are the activities you can do with them to create that positive, positive um, growth within the child and within the home. So again, we've, we've, we still run the PCAP program, but we've modified it to work more for family-centered. So we're still wrapping services around that individual, and we're still targeting the high-risk families, linking them up to service providers, and providing that education around FASD. Um, and then one more detail to that last slide was the uh, across the lifespan. So we all know that when children grow up, they become adults. And with an FASD diagnosis, it, it, diagnosis, there's no cure for it. It's a lifelong disability. So what we know is that when these children grow up to be adults, our work isn't done. Our work continues as they become adults. And my colleague, Michelle, is the one that provides the support across the lifespan. So she provides the support to the individuals who become adults. And she be, actually becomes their exterior brain. She provides them with um, a basic essential day-to-day um, -day living services, um, money management services, um, linking them up with other agencies, and just going there to make sure that they're okay and that they're protected and that their basic needs are being met. So she does a lot of the adult intervention. Um, the third part of our programming is the cultural part. So we know we do, the multi, we do the multidisciplinary team approach. We do the diagnosis. We do the PCAP. We do the family-centered. We do the across the lifespan. Well, with this model, with First Nations, we're kind of, we've kind of integrated our whole program within it. So we look at the future and the spiritual part of it. We're diagnosing our children early so we know how to provide the best support for them immediately. Um, we look at the strengths of the family and of the child and of the community, and we provide that support with them. So we look at how we can support them, what we can do, and how we can build on the strengths of that family. We do a lot of teaching. With the FASD, um, what we know about FASD, we know that everything changes. Not one child's diagnosis is the same to the next child. No, child. So we know that there's a lot of teaching behind it. We know that there's a lot of tears behind it because with First Nations, um, FASD is, is very um, hush. It's not a topic that's addressed very lightly. And... Um, we're the ones that are beginning to teach people how to talk about it, to teach people that talking about FASD isn't taboo and that it's okay to be angry about it. So we, we, we stray away from judgment, judgmental um, teachings, and we, we gear our teachings towards um, looking at the strength of the child, looking at the strength of the community. And we also, if we can, get the bio mother involved, and we look at teaching her as well and providing intervention services. So we do a lot of teaching behind FASD. Um, support, there's a lot of support given to the family. There's a lot of support given to the school and the family service worker or, and the foster parents and the family themselves. So we do a lot of support within the community. There's a lot of FASD sessions that we do. We do support. We do one-on-one. -on -one. We do sessions in the evening and during the day. Um, wherever we're needed is where we go because our whole role is to educate our community about FASD and letting them know it's not taboo and that we can't change the past, but we can change the future. So we're not here to judge them, we're here to support them. Um, and I'm a very huge advocate for supporting bio mothers. And I know the, the hardships that come behind them. And I also know with First Nations communities, there's, a, there's huge determinants that, that kind of hinder a lot of mothers in their process of um, becoming parents. So we do a lot of teaching behind that. We do a lot of education behind it. And my whole thing with my staff is go where you need to go and teach what you need to teach. So then the three programs are combined into one program. And then again, the beautiful um, logo and um, 
drawing was from one of our sixth grade, our six six year old children in our program, child in our program. So I talked earlier about the PCAT program, and this is just kind of a little picture of how we've integrated it and moved it into family centered. So with a PCAT program, the mentor is the one that provides the support to the children and the families and to the service providers and links them all up in this beautiful um, design that wraps these services around this individual, that wraps these services around this high risk mother. What we've done with the program out in Siksika is we've just moved the mentor down to the families and the child is our center. Because with First Nations communities, traditionally the children are our center. We, we traditionally wrap our care, our support, everything that we do is around this child. So we've kind of stepped back and kind of went back into the traditional role and wrapped all our services around um, the child. So it just kind of gives a beautiful illustration of how we've moved from um, mentoring as being the top to child being the top. So we've just, we've done the same thing. We're doing the same thing the PCAT model does, but we're just moving everything around the child. So we'll look at the three pillars of support with the FASD program and what we do within our community. So the first one is assessment and diagnosis. So we'll talk a little bit about the clinic that we do out here. Um, with assessment, there's a, we, there's a lot of paperwork because we don't want to label or give this children a diagnosis with a label that they're going to be that they're going to have to live with for the rest of their life. We want to make sure that when we're giving this diagnosis, possible diagnosis for this child, that we're providing the best possible care and we're being very sensitive with what we're doing. So it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of gathering um, pre previous assessments from the schools, um, hospital reports, psych psychiatrist reports, psychologist reports, any school testing, any other testing that's done on that child um, that, can that can assist us with the clinical process. So again, it does take a lot of work. It's a, kind of like an investigator because you're gathering as much information you can on this child who's ever done any testing on this child, who's ever had any kind of interaction with this child. We're looking for that information. <clears throat> Along with that, we're looking for confirmation of alcohol during pregnancy. So we're looking at confirmation from the bio biological mother. We're looking at confirmation from hospital records. And anyone who can support that, yeah, mom did drink during her pregnancy. Because a lot of biological mothers will say, no, they didn't drink. Um, even when they're, um, the hospital records will say, mother said no, that she didn't drink during her pregnancy. And a lot of them um, will say no because they have a lot of fear. They have that fear that they're going to be judged and they're ashamed of what they did. So they're not going to be truthful in those hospital records. So our job is to actually sit with mom and tell her what our role is. And we're very sensitive in approaching the biological mother because our priority is getting the best care for this child. So when we sit with her, we, we explain the whole process of what our role is and um, we let her know that we're not here to judge her, we're here to support her, and we let her know why we need this confirmation. And the, the mothers that we've worked with have been really good with us. And they've given us the confirmation because of the approach we take. And not only that, um, I think our role within the community that we're First Nations and they know our what we do and which families we come from really helps us with this whole role of um, diagnosing the children. Again, our partnership is with Renfrew Educational Services, so they're, they, they're the multidisciplinary team. They're the ones that provide the psychologist, the occupational um, therapist, the speech and language, um, and they're the ones that come out and do the testing and the assessments on the children. Um, the pediatrician on board is actually a doctor um, with um, health, Six Sixaga Health Services under clinical services, and he's been advocating very hard for this um, FASD clinic um, with health services, and his name is Fred D. Banning. So he's been a huge advocate for getting these children um, assessed, and he's been a huge support of this program. So I want to thank Fred D. Banning and acknowledge his work with the program. Um, we diagnose children between the ages of 6 and 17, and um, we, um, that's the age group that we work with.
pillar two is awareness and prevention services. So a lot of pillar two is PCAP, but a lot of it is actually Michelle's work. And I'll talk a little bit about what the slide has, the next slide has for us, but I'm gonna welcome Michelle up after that and have her give you um, some information on what she does, because she's the one that actually goes out into the community and does a lot of this prevention work. She advocates very hard for the program along with the clients. So intervention and support. Um, this is one of our, on the slide, this is our FASD quilt. It was done by the um, clients within our program. And the ones who put it together, the ladies in the picture, are the ones who um, actually qu did the quilt for us, did the sewing and everything. And they've been um, our elders for the program. They're our huge supporters within the program. And they're the ones that help us with the teaching to other, to new families. They'll come in and help us with the teachings. But I'll let Michelle kind of talk a little about a little bit about them when she comes up. So we do a lot of school and community presentations, basic FASD awareness, um, nursery like um, Head Start presentations, um, anywhere and everywhere that we've been asked to go, we'll go, and we try to reach out our services to these people and agencies. There's a lot of community awareness that we do in this area. Um, I'm going to invite Michelle up and I'd like her to speak about what she does and her role and um, how she advocates for her clients. Good morning, I'm Michelle. We actually have the quilt here, so if we want to just show you guys the quilt quick, this is more clear than the picture. Um, there's hand prints on the quilt everywhere because that's a big representation of our program with, like Vanessa explained, the six-year-old child that actually named our logo. And this, this blanket actually sits in our community wellness area and people get to observe it and look at it every day as they pass by. So it has our logo, has our FASD logo, our health logo, and you can't really see since push it push it this way but this way. Yeah. so you can't really see the feathers but we have feathers that um, are representing all the children in the program so we have to put on another at least another 20 more feathers because that's how many more children we have diagnosed with FASD so this is one of our greatest accomplishments was the FASD quilt. So going back to intervention and prevention, like Vanessa said, we go anywhere we're needed. Um, when I first started the program, I needed to know what our community actually knew about FASD. Because when I first started, I had no information about who was our clients or who was, you know, like, the person before me actually didn't really document very well, I guess. But when I went out to the community, I needed to know what they, what they knew, and I did a survey. I did a five-question survey just basically on what they knew about FASD, and there was a lot of people that had worked in the band office and the schools and just community people that really didn't know anything about FASD. Actually, one of our elders thought that FASD was an STI, and it was a fun, funny story, but um, yeah, I had to explain to him that FASD was actually a, a mother to baby consumption during pregnancy. So when I first started, I went into a nursery school at the Crowfoot School back home, and I thought to myself, how am I going to teach babies about FASD? Kids that are just three, four years old. So my biggest challenge was to teach them about FASD, and how I did it was a visual aid. I had a jug with a baby in there and an apple juice, and all of the kids poured apple juice into the, to the container, and I held it by my belly, and I told the kids, okay, we're, I'm the pregnant mom, but we're all, we're all together, we're all a body. And as the kids were pouring in the juice, there was a few kids that didn't want to, so I didn't force them to. But one of the boys at the local gym told me, teacher, teacher, and I looked down at him and I said, yeah, and he said, when I get pregnant, I'm not going to drink when I have a baby, and I was like, oh my gosh, that was a little boy, you know, but to me, I thought, yeah, he, you know, it was miscon misconception of 
the information, but he's going to know, you know, my wife is not going to drink, you know, or I'm not going to allow her to drink when she's pregnant. Um, I've been with the program for about four years, and there's so much information and awareness that we had that Tally, well, our previous coworker had done since we first started. And we just got out to the community. Either way, like we had a brochure, and we handed that out at an FASD barbecue. And our colleague over at Mike, he went over all the questions. And he told the community, do you know what FASD is? And then he's like, well, 49% of the community doesn't know what it is. You know, and 51, you know, he, he actually read out the information on the brochure. And people were really interested. They, they actually came up to us and took the brochure. So just getting out there, even like social networking. I know we're not supposed to do social networking, but, you know, just randomly, maybe once a month, I'll put something about FASD out there. And people actually reply back to it. Either if it's negative or positive, I still answer them in a constructive way. And I've actually had a lot of people inbox me about FASD. And I tell them, we're here for you. You guys can come. And our numbers have grown drastically since the beginning, since when I have started four years back. And we've actually diagnosed probably close to 30 children since we've had that information out there. and. Um, like Vanessa said, we have, ad I actually have adult sessions with the parents or the foster parents. As soon as their child is diagnosed, I do a one-on-one -on -one session with the parents. And when I'm done the session, the parents are like beside themselves. They're so stunned with the information that, you know, it's basic FASD information about how the brain develops. And, um, you know, I, I, I often tell them that they're not going to be cured. The child's not going to be cured. This is how your child's going to be for the rest of your life. Foster, biological, you know, grandparents. And these people are so beside themselves. Some of them are, like, literally crying. And they're thinking, well, why? You know, like, they have questions. But we tell them, well, what we can do for you is we can strengthen your ability to help these people, to strengthen them like to live with them to be their exterior brain for the rest of their lives because it's not going to get easier it's going to get harder as they get older so you know that's one of the biggest i guess challenges that i have is having to tell their parents that the child is not never going to grow out of it never going to be cured and you know from that from that point on if they do need extra services i do push them on to mental health and tell them that there's therapists and psychologists there to help. We also present at the NADA program, the Mad Child program, and in a lot of the storefront schools. Just basic FASD and what they, what they need to know and how they can prevent it. Okay, I'm just looking. So during all the information sessions, like with our support group, I implement the cultural and heritage into our program. We actually have um, support groups that we have our clients come in and we teach them how to smudge, we teach them how to pray, you know, if they want to learn in that cultural aspect. And I'll actually go on more with more information. So. So like Vanessa said, we were pretty much around the parents, the families, and everybody that's taking care of the child. Um, so for one child in our program, there's about five to six people in their families, and we have to teach those families. You know, you have to be patient. You have to take time out of your day to help them. They, You know, they're, each child is different, but when... The diagnosis comes back to us, like Vanessa says, we tear it apart. I have to read each and every individual caseload and to see what these children need. 
and there's recommendations for what the child needs. So I pass that information on to the families. But on Vanessa's part, she passes it on to the schools. So we sit down with the families and I let them know that these recommendations were set for the child. And there's, in any way, I always try and help them out with, um, like if they need specific exercise equipment, if they need lunches, you know, our, our resource support is unlimited pretty much and with the people that we give help are those that are pretty much PGO right no no TGO PGO sorry and that's permanent guardianship in some cases we have some families that are that have adopted the child so we kind of focus more on them because those families have less help financially so we kind of focus more on them and we help them more um, there's a lot of goal setting by like month to month. So I have calendars for the families and with the, it's like a chore list. Okay, if you accomplish all this, at the end of the month, you're going to get a reward. You know, and we see if it gets better by the month. If not, then we try to work on something visual, like a jar. Okay, here's some gold coins. If you do the dishes, you know, until it fills up and then... If it fills up, then you will get a reward for that. Case planning. With the family members, we always go over what, like I said, what, what, what's recommended for the child. And if the child needs to seek therapy or um, actually one of our children is so hyperactive that he, I actually have a Reiki master going in with him and teaching the parents and the child about... Um, it's, in, it's called introductory to energy, but it's really, it's meditating. And the first session that the child had, you know, he calmed down. You know, just from the Reiki master showing the parent what to do. And it was actually really good because when we actually had a support group, we did the meditation. And when we did the meditation, I don't know if Vanessa and Tayan were there, but, like, everybody in the whole room literally fell asleep, even the kids. We were, like, the Reiki master was so good. She calmed everybody down, and, you know, we all ended up drifting off. But I think that's one, one of the main keys is to teach your children to relax, to meditate, you know, put music on, running water. Um, but that's just one of the links that I do try and link to the families. There's many other links. Um, there's so many, I'm just trying to think. Like with the recreational services. Our, most of these kids are so hyperactive. A lot, of, a lot of them are kind of diagnosed with ADD also. So they need to run. They need to keep going and going. So there's a few kids that I know that are, um, they have participated in hockey. They've participated in basketball you know, just different different sporting events. I actually, my husband and I, we have a basketball program back home that we run every Mondays and Wednesdays, and there's about six kids that are diagnosed with FASD that are actually in our program. And they run, 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 run. You know, we keep them busy. At the end of the day, we let them know, how do you feel now? And they're so tired from running and running and running, you know. So when they, when they go home, they have a good sleep. And the parent has actually asked me, you know, like the basketball program has really calmed the child down because they have all that energy that they need to burn off. So that's just one of our services that we provide to our community. We have different levels of community support and service providers. So like I said, we've gone out, we've, I've presented to nursery schools, all the way up to like the family one-on-one, -on -one, to family services, and it's very interesting how to actually find out how our community doesn't know anything about FASD. Like Vanessa said, it's very taboo. But once we once we've got actually gone out there, we've actually had 30 kids in probably three years, right, that have been diagnosed. So I guess for us, that's a good thing. You know, we might have another 30 more in three years. Hopefully we have a, at least two more workers because Tayana and I right now, we're kind of overloaded. Do you want to talk about this? 
One more thing I'd like to add to Michelle's presentation is the schools. Um, we've actually um, helped teachers um, with activities with the students. So we've, Michelle has suggested the stress balls. When a child is very fidgety and moving around, we have children that move around and kind of go under the desks or run out of the classroom and are just too overstimulated in the classroom setting that we've suggested to teachers stress balls. We suggested to teachers letting that child stand up and run around for a few minutes. Um, I know Michelle has suggested to um, a teacher to um, every 15 minutes to let them go to the gym and just run because we have one child that just needs to run and he's so hyper that she finds that when he's after he's had his five minutes in the gym he comes back he's calmed down. So we've really worked with the schools and helping the teachers um, with providing um, some care for the child in the school setting. Um, so we know a lot of this, the teachers in the school setting have indicated that they have such huge numbers in the classroom settings that um, it's really hard to support, support that individual support to the child. So Michelle is really awesome at sitting with the teachers and telling them this is how you can work with them. This is the, the activities you can try with the child. Um, this is what has worked for another child of ours um, and looking at best practices. So we do a lot with the schools as well. Um, the third pillar with FASD is support for individuals and caregivers. So this is another big part of Michelle's job. Um, she works with the adults that have been previously diagnosed before entering our program. So they come to us with a, a FASD di diagnosis and, and they're adults. So she provides that across the lifespan support. She provides that one-on-one -on -one support with them and she actually becomes their exterior brain. So maybe Michelle, can I just have you come up here and just kind of talk about your what you do with the adults with living with FASD? Sorry, I needed water. Okay, working with adults that have been diagnosed. Um, there's a few adults that we don't know where their diagnosis have have gone. So I've actually got them re-diagnosed with Medigene. And when they find out that they've actually gone through their actual di diagnosis as an adult, that they weren't properly diagnosed as a child. And they were diagnosed by one individual. So we all know that that, that can't happen. Um, so I work closely with the adults with budgeting, monthly updates about how the adults are. And like I tell Vanessa, it's not an 8 to 4.30 job. It's never going to be an 8 to 4.30 job. I'm actually at our sports complex until maybe 10 o'clock at night. And if I see one of our clients walking on the road, you know, I'll pick them up. And I'll ask them, well, how are you doing? And I've had one individual, he, he keeps telling me, you know, I'm doing really bad. And I tell him, well, you have to keep trying, you know, keep trying. Come and see me. We'll see what we can do. We can help you out. We've, I've done budgeting with him, personal hygiene. He loses his IDs at least monthly, on a monthly note. Like every, every month he's like, I lost my IDs. Okay, well, give me a photocopy. I photocopied them, put them in his file. And another thing that is kind of sad is the funding. Their funding, they don't actually know how to budget their money. So you have to keep teaching them on almost like on a monthly basis. And with his money... Excuse me. You know, I don't know if he's getting ripped off at the local store or his family's ripping him off, but it's after like a week, his check is all gone. So as of right now, we're trying to find a trustee for him. You know, and it's sad to say, but it does happen. You know, so we're, as of right now, we're trying to look for a trustee for him. Um, he hasn't applied for his taxes for a really long time. He's the same age as me, and I think it was like maybe 20, no, 18, 17 years back where he had back taxes. So, and he didn't know that he was supposed to apply for his taxes when he was 19, but we did all that, and you know, it, what, what money that he had, it went into a bank account. So we're, we're trying to at least get him to buy his personal items that he needs on a monthly basis. And he's actually applying for age. 
A lot of them cannot actually read the documentation, so I have to sit down with them and go over the age forms and then find somebody trustworthy to actually take over their money. Because as of right now, I can't do that where, where I work. Um, it's really hard to see them, I guess, fall. A lot of them, you know, that, that's their life. That's the only thing they know. That's the, on, that's the only place where their friends are at. So we try to get them, I try to get them to go through training sessions, um, work experience sessions. I try to get them all signed up for that. And I, but I let the instructors know that this child or this, this adult has, um, you know, a mental capacity of a 10-year-old, 11-year-old. So the instructors actually know, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to actually push this individual harder than I should. I'm, when was it, last year in December? Uh, my husband and I, we thought, well, for, with me working with FASD, I need to know how it feels to live with somebody who has FASD. So back home, we had a boy that was coming out of the youth treatment center, and he actually burnt his high school gym down with a few friends that he had. So I knew what he did, I knew what his diagnosis was, and I asked him, you know, would you like to stay in Sixago with us? And he laughed, and he was like, yeah, okay, I really would, but yeah, okay. Like, not thinking that I was actually going to take him in. And he was six, he's six five, and he's really smart, but he's not as severe as some of the children living, living with FASD. We enrolled him into high school. We had a hell of a time enrolling him. Sorry for my language, but um, be, him burning down his high school gym, nobody was going to take him in. So we talked to the principal like for about maybe a good two weeks trying to get him in. She took him in. He played basketball. But unfortunately, he moved out of our house, and he got into trouble. So I thought, I can't give up on this child. I have to, I have to help him. So when he got kicked out of school, he got kicked out of where he was living, I told him, you have to pack your stuff up. You're going to go down to the blood reserve. And he was like, okay. When we, when we packed him up and everything, he didn't actually think that I was going to get him into school down there. But we did. We got him into school. He's actually graduating this year. Um, when we first let him come stay with us, he's never left Alberta. Like, that's how... Um, I guess limited his, like he, how he was. So last summer we took him to Phoenix with us. We took him to LA to play basketball. You know, he's an astounding basketball player. And as of right now, he's graduating grade 12. He's on our Team Alberta basketball team U19, and he'll be representing Alberta in the Indigenous Games in July. So I asked him just last weekend, well, just actually a couple days ago, if you didn't stay here, where would you be? He told me truthfully, I would be dead, or I would be drinking, or I would be in jail. And I figured, well, you made a good choice, because this was your choice. It wasn't our choice. But like going back to that, we've had a lot of difficult, difficulties with him, and with his personal hygiene, with his budgeting, like... Everything that I explained here, you know, and now he, he budgets his money really well. He's always tells me, well, I had to buy all my personals. You know, he just kind of keeps me updated. And this individual isn't from our reserve. He's from a northern reserve. And like I said, we had to, be, we had to actually live with somebody that had FASD in order to actually talk about our experiences. So this individual is he's really doing well now. And we're proud of him. So then I think that was for me from just hounding him and being his exterior brain and telling him, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. You know, so that's, I guess that's one of my supports across an adult lifespan. You going to go back on? Um, 
one thing we'd like to stress, given on what Michelle has talked about, a lot of these children can succeed. Um, we, we always tell service providers that they can become um, post-secondary students, they can become graduates, they can get degrees, and they can teach and, and, and do the stuff that we all do. Um, they just have to be supported. They just need that structure. Um, and we give them all those key concepts to provide the success for this child. So the example that Michelle gave is, 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 prime, is a prime situation for using those basic FASD concepts and having this child su su to succeed on um, given his strengths. So yeah, um, that's just a, I'd like to commend Michelle because she did a really good job with this child. So those are the three pillars of the F FASD. And what I'd like to make note of is, um, sorry, just one moment. OK. So the program in um, Siksika provides the support in all these three pillars. Of, in the FASD realm, in the FASD programming. So we provide assessment and diagnosis, we provide awareness and prevention, and we provide supports across the lifespan. What the program has also done nationally is we've hit the five pillars which is child and youth ministry. And I'm very proud of this program because it's the first program um, in Alberta that's providing this kind of support. So we're setting the milestone for other First Nations communities and other FASD programs. So we're very proud of the work we do. And given that we're such short-staffed, I think we've, we've accomplished a lot with what we've done. So we do prevention services. Um, Early intervention, a lot of the work Michelle does is the prevention with the families, with getting a diagnosis, with talking to bio mothers. Early intervention is going into the schools, going out into the community, talking to the biological mothers, talking to families, and just going out there and having people listen to us. A lot of intervention and support is done again to the community, to the families. Um, a lot of this inter intertwines with one another. A lot of this we do on a daily basis, and it's just back and forth, back and forth, what we do with our services. We have the Aboriginal approach. A lot of the cultural stuff Michelle talks about, she does with programming. So she's, she's a, um, very aware of the community we come from. And Michelle, given Michelle's own traditional background, she provides a lot of that within our programming. And then there's quality assurance. We're always trying to find out what works best for our program, what works best for the services we provide, and what works best for the clients we provide services for. So with Michelle's mini survey she does within the communities, I know Michelle said she started off with a five-question survey. She's now up to a ten-question survey, and she's out there twice a year asking different communities, what do you know about FASD? What is FASD? Um, do you have any family members who are FASD? It's just real basic um, questions she asks the community and actually when those questions come back to us the answers is what we develop our programming on so if we see that there's an area that these people don't know about or are lacking that's the area we focus on so these little questionnaires she does within the community help us structure programming help us provide that quality assurance to the to the community and like I said she does this twice a year and with given the size of the nation um, I want to commend her because she goes out there and she's very optimistic and she's out there during the time when we know that people are going to be within the community. So we hit the community during um, family service when they're getting their checks. We go out there during um, family allowance, GST, um, paydays, when we're having our voting within the nation. She was out there asking people, what do you know about FASD? This is my role. What, what can you tell me? And then that's what we provide services on because we know people are out in the community and we target them in that area because we know we're going to get the best possible feedback we can get from the community. I'm going to let Michelle talk about this because this is what she did with the this, this school, um, grade six students at Crowfoot School. Yeah. Let me just try to go back. Okay. So in the first year I was with the FASD program, I went to the schools. Um, I did, 
I think it was a presentation in each class, like I said, from nursery to grade six. So with the last class, with the grade six class, I had kind of a contest on the posters and what they knew about FASD. And like when I got the posters back, it was just remarkable to see with the 45 minute session that I had with the children, what they knew about FASD, what, you know, like I just pretty much just gave them the 10, 10 facts about FASD and what they came up with it with their posters was just, it was, it was amazing. And I couldn't pick, actually pick a poster because they were all just so, like, as you can see, they're all just so informative and they were great. So we just ended up buying the whole class pizzas because I was thinking, which one do I pick? And there's so many net networks that actually want copies of our posters, but I'd have to get it approved before I actually give them out. I don't know if you can really see this one. I saved this one for last. It says, drinking hurts newborn babies' lives. And it says, hello, 911. I picked, sorry. I can't really read it from this, from where I am. It says, hello, 911. I picked the day to drink. My baby's coming, please help me. And like there's beer bottles all over the house. It says house party and the cops are actually knocking on the door here. And this, this one really caught my attention because the mother's, you know, she's actually drunk at that time. And I thought, wow, these grade sixes from Crowfoot School actually picked up on what I said from 45 minutes. And these grade six, this grade six class, they're actually in grade eight now. And they still actually remember everything that I've told them about, about FASD. So. Yeah. so we have community events Within Siksika, we have at least, Siksika Health, we have at least three to four major events through our health services. One of them is the health fair, and that's where I really get out to the, actually, this is our Christmas dinner. I don't know if you could really see, but I think we had about, I know we broke the fire coat that day, so, um, <laughs> I think they said we had close to a thousand people in that building that day, and there was only supposed to be like 750 people, but we kind of put them in different areas of the building. And this is our Christmas dinner, our health services Christmas dinner. All of our programs together, we put money together to feed all of our clients. Pretty much, it's a big feast for the whole community. And everybody knows that we have it. They're all excited about it because actually each program we all chip in for toys for the kids, for food for the families, and then we have great door prizes for people to come out. And I'm proud to say every year we win the gingerbread house contest. <laughs> I don't know if I have a picture of that. So this is our community culture camp. This is our big, our big baby every year. We put a lot of money into this. The children there are making costumes, and we're having fun. We're having a talent night. We take the children hiking. It's about a two-hour hike. And we spend a good evening on our traditional... Oh, our pictures are going a bit too fast. Yeah. So we'll just go through them, and then I'll explain everything. So we have a four-day culture camp. On the first day, we get everybody settled in. We have everybody settled in to their tents, and we try to get teepees there at, at the camp. We have our camp in Castle Mountain that's located 20 minutes outside of Banff. It's a beautiful, 
beautiful land. And we have at least 10 families. We have about four families that we, we select from our FASD program. And then we have another six families with different communities. Um, there's, there's many different things we do there. We take them swimming. We take them hiking. We have a mini powwow. But the most important thing is we have a traditional day. Um, every morning we have a smudge. We make sure we have an elder or a society member that comes in and smudges. And like there's just so many, so many things and so many sessions to our camp. It's just, it's a fun filled four days, but those four days go by really fast. But our major, I guess, cultural event that we have there is the, cult the cultural day. And that's the last day, would be, which would be a Thursday. During the day, we have traditional games. During the morning, we have traditional games. We have um, storytelling in the afternoon. And then once they're doing, like, if we have a group of 50 kids, we try and divide them up into 10. And then we have five or six different elders. And those elders sit around and tell them stories from way back, way, way back, like 1700s, 1800s. And... After they're done telling the children those stories, we get the children to reenact them. So they act they're actually listening, and they're actually learning from this, something from the story. And a few, a few pictures back, there were some kids that were um, talking about the Buffalo Rock, talking about not be coming down from the mountains. With um, There's a big rock in Okotoks. Like, there's a story about that rock. So some of the kids are, you know, they're learning about those, those landmarks and all those old traditional stories. So once they're done that, we have a traditional meal at 6 o'clock, which we have um, tripe, kidney. You know, there's just a bunch of dif different traditional meals that we have all in one. And once we're done the traditional meal, we have a mini powwow. We have all the kids. We give them bags, and there's different, I guess, types of dance dancing in the bags like grass dancing, fancy dancing, jingle dress, and they're given out to a group. Um, oh, I forgot how to... When we break off our groups, they have to come up with an, with an Indian name. Like, one of the names I, I forget was named Buffalo Wings. You know, it, it's, it's a funny traditional name, but it's Buffalo Wings. One was named Spicy Buffalo. One was named Mild Buffalo. You know, it, it was really funny. All the different kids had different names. But we're, we try to teach them about different clans in our Blackfoot lifestyle. So once we're done breaking them off and giving them their bags, they actually know what dance or what type of dance they have. And then they make that outfit. So we have a big powwow. And they all stand behind their delegate dancer. And then we have one big power for all of them. Like, it's just, it's amazing, and it's fun. And then after that, we have a good smudge. We go to bed. We get them to bed early, and we let them know that, you know, we're, we're departing the next day. So, but it's, it's really fun, and it's Castle Mountain. Here's a beautiful picture of Castle Mountain. Sorry. We actually have cooking classes for some of the adults and some of the mothers that just need to get away. We show them how to make bannock, different traditional foods. And these are two ladies that both, um, Sharon on the far side, she has a son that has been living with Down syndrome for almost 30 years. And we welcome her to our program because... It's a brain disorder, what, you know, all of the women are dealing with. So she's one of our main supports. And Anne, on the closest to me, she's had a child for almost over 20 years also. So actually she's taking care of two children. And they have so much knowledge and so much help to the program. Like, they're there all the time. And... We also have Victoria. Her foster son is actually going to be 37, and he's severely diagnosed with FASD. So she brings a lot to our program, too. They're actually my mentors. 
So I love these ladies so much. You want to talk about this? So uh, we talked about providing awareness in the community, and we've done a couple FASD meet and greet sessions. So we talk about our programming, but we also talk about FASD, and we invite people out to also support us in our in our um, awareness sessions. So during this particular session, we invited Annette Cutknife, Cutknife out to Sixaga Nation, and she talked about her birth mother experience. And then we've we've um, invited um, um, Miles. Miles, Miles, Miles Hemrick, who's been diagnosed with FASD and who, who has come and talked to the Sixaga Nation twice about his disorder. So what we try to do yearly is we try to do an FASD meet and greet, and we just invite whatever services and whatever community members want to come out and just learn about FASD and hear from people who are diagnosed and hear from birth parents who are living with children who are FASD affected and just kind of know that they're not alone. So we do a lot of, um, you know, uh, awareness sessions to let people know that we're here and that we're here to support them. Yeah. Um. These are some of the grandmothers and great-grandmothers in the community. And some of them have passed away, but... When we see these women in the community, it's, it's joyful and it's exciting to see them. You know, because these are our mothers and our great-grandmothers and our grandmothers that taught us everything. And in the past, when we had a child living with FASD or any kind of special disabilities, the grandmother would always take that child in and she would pretty much... That would be her special child. She knew, you know, they knew that something was wrong with that child. So that child would be surrounded by the whole family, and pretty much nobody can touch that child. Nobody can talk bad to that child. And, you know, it's just something that our grandmothers and our mothers had special in their heart for them because they knew that they were actually dealing with a disorder or they were special in their own way. So that's why I put our beautiful mothers up there. And that's the end of our presentation. Uh, the first question comes from Richard in Vancouver, and he asks, where does the nation get their funding from, and then how are the funds distributed? Um, with our program within the nation, we actually have um, several funders. Um, it's in partnership with the clinic, the FASD clinic. It's in partnership with Siksika, um Family Services. So they're actually the ones that cover the cost for the clinic, um, for um, the, the multidisciplinary team to come out and diagnose the children. Um, for the services I provide, the FASD clinic itself, they're the ones that provide that monetary support. With Michelle's program, the PCAP, modified PCAP program, it's being provided, the funding's being provided by the province. So they're the ones that have taken on the initiative to support this amended PCAP program to roll out within the community. Yeah. Second question is also from Richard, and I hope I'm going to do this question justice. Um, so he's asking about the diagnostic report that you get. Um, how do you then take that report and sort of translate it into the programs and services that you then assist with? Okay, so we have a really close relationship with Renfrew Educational Services, and what they do is the psychologist will give her recommendations, the occupational um, therapist will give her recommendations, and speech and language will give their recommendations, and the doctor will give their recommendation, his recommendations. And what we do is we take those recommendations, and they're really clear in how they do these recommendations and what works best for the home setting and what works best for the school setting. So what we do is we divide these two up into two groups, and we look at the strengths of the family, and what the recommendations are, and we build the um, case plan around those recommendations. Then we look at the recommendations for the school, and we build the case plan around those recommendations. So Michelle takes the family recommendations, and she sits with the family, and she says, um, because when we do clinic, 
the multidisciplinary team, when we have clinic day, we'll, it, the results are given to the family, are given to the school, are given to um, family services and the parents of what this child child has been diagnosed with. And what they'll do is they'll remind what we'll do is we'll remind them this is what was said on clinic day, and these are the recommendations that the um, the team has for you for the home setting. So we'll go over basic stuff like how to work with them with their speech impairment, how to work with them with their um, behavior disability, how to work with them with their hyperactivity. And the team, the multidisciplinary team's report is very detailed. They have tons of recommendations. And the visual stuff they recommend, because they do, they do recommend a lot, a lot of visual stuff, Michelle will go help them with. So they have visual stuff for everyday home activities. She's the one that will prepare that for them. If they have visual stuff for just day-to-day -day hygiene, she's the one who will do that visual, get that visual stuff ready. So she gets the home ready. And then the school recommendations is my job. So I'll look at how the child can work with the teacher can work with the child in the school setting. So if this this child is very hyper, give this child breaks. These are the activities the team is recommended. These are the tools you can use. These are the books they're referencing. We really we prepare packages for the school and the home setting based on these recommendations. So it's really um, a two part kind of thing that Michelle and I do together. Another question, this one's from Lucretia in Calgary. She says, thank you for your work. Uh, does the father's drinking affect the fetus, and are any aspects of FASD passed on to the second generation? Um, there's no, it's, it's a real controversial topic. To my, to my knowledge and what I understand is that it, it can't be passed on from fathers. Um, I know there's some argument with genetics, saying that genetically they can pass on the um, the disease of alcohol to their to their next generation. But with FASD itself, it's really mother to child consumption. So, if mom wasn't drinking and the father's an alcoholic, there's no, no that's not saying the child's going to be um, have FASD. There's no data to support that right now. But like I said, it's real sensitive, and I know there's arguments for the genetic genetic part of it. But our whole role here is to tell people that it's mother to baby consumption. And I'm sorry, the second part of that was. Are any aspects of FASD passed on to the second generation? Um, the only way we see second generation um, effects is if mom had a child, she drank during her pregnancy, and then she had this child who's FASD, and that child drank during her pregnancy. But if we have moms in a program who are diagnosed as FASD, who haven't drank during their pregnancy, and their children are fine, and what our, our goal with those women is parenting. Parenting these children, um, providing parent, basic parenting to this, to this child because maybe this mom is having problems with parenting. She doesn't understand milestones. She doesn't understand um, bottle feeding. She doesn't understand proper food intake. She doesn't understand how to pro properly discipline. Um, that's the stuff we teach her, mom, how to parent. But the child, there's no supporting data of that right now. I uh, thank you for your presentation. I I'm curious about um, the effect that involving families with children with FASD or adults with FASD um, in in activities with families who aren't affected by FASD. So you it sounds as though you have a very mixed population going to your camps and mm -hmm. participating in a lot of your community events. And have you noticed the difference that that makes for the families that that um, are affected by FASD and as well as the families who aren't affected by FASD? Does it have any effect on their understanding and appreciation of FASD and how to better support uh, their families. We have two families that come and they, when they come to like the support groups and the culture camp, I actually had one of the mothers, bio mothers, said that what we, the information that we relayed back to her was like a big relief off her chest because she knew that we were there for her. She knew that we were going to help her. And when a bio grandmother and the mother actually met at the camp, they connected. And they, had, they found out that they had more supports. 
to go out into the community and actually talk amongst one another. And with the people that aren't affected with FASD, it opens their eyes, you know, on how these children are going to be affected for the rest of their lives and how it is more, it, it's really important to get that information out there. We have a lot of advocates in our community that actually help us with FASD and to teach the children and to teach, you know, like grandmothers. A lot of people really listen to our grandmothers in our community. And if grandma says so, it's right. Regardless if she has, she's wrong in just, you know, the smallest way, grandma's right. You know, you got to listen to grandma. So we have a lot of older ladies that do come through our program and help us in that, in that area. So... And within a First Nations community, we're very um, community family. We're very family centered. So when we bring these families together, there's a huge amount of support for one another. So when we're providing support for children or like the camps, all the children are hyper. All the children are running around. So we're just kind of providing that support to the families, and everybody just kind of wraps their arms around everyone during these times. So we've never actually encountered anything where it's negative. It's always been positive, and it's always been supported by each of the families that are involved in the programming or whatever activity is involved. And there's that sensitivity behind it because these families come in knowing that some are from FASD, some are from Brighter Futures, some are from NADAP, some are from... Um, the mental health program. So they come in with a lot of with a lot of various um, diagnoses, disabilities, mental health issues. It's not just FASD. So they come in there with a little sensitivity, knowing that they're going to be supported by one another because they're not alone in in whatever issue that they're facing right now. So it's really it's mul really multidisciplinary that way. Where um, it's it's really supportive. It's a supportive environment with the families. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question from Trevor. Uh, are supports available for a child with FASD who's a member of the Siksika Nation but living off reserve? Um, that's a hard thing. The thing with the f services we provide, we're restricted by jurisdiction. So we're restricted to reserve. Um, if the child was to come back to the nation, then of course we would provide that support. But we have a lot of linkages. We have a lot of networking off reserve that if this person was to... In, um, um, get a hold of us. We know how to link them up and what services we're networking with and how to provide that support for them off reserve. Um, but I'm afraid we're, we're, we're restricted to the jurisdiction of the, the nation. Yeah. Next question comes from Bernadette. Uh, she says your presentation is wonderful uh, and she would like to know if you're keeping track of statistics and tracking data on the supports and your services uh, so that you know whether they're actually working for prevention and reducing alcohol-related pregnancies. Um, yeah, that's what we do. We, when we go out and do um, presentations, we do evaluations. Um, we try to do um, quality assurance on our programming. So we, like, like, Tyann's our data collection, so she's the one that's um, getting all the data from the clients, getting all the data we do within the community, and looking at where we're at with that, where we're lacking, where the gaps are, what we're overemphasizing, what we're not emphasizing. Um, we're always constantly looking at our program and seeing what's working and not working, and that's on a yearly basis. So we're always trying to see what's the best quality assurance we can provide for the community. Can you comment uh, specifically about the PCAP uh, data and and the changes that you're seeing uh, with the families participating in that program? Um, PCAP is still very, very new. We don't actually use the um, PCAP forms, like the ASI and that, because we're not working with bio moms. What we're doing with PCAP, and it's a partnership with um, the PCAP Council and with... Um, Teresa Grant and getting her to approve the forms that we do use. Um, like I said, it's a process. So we're actually just using the family-centered forms right now. We're not using basic formal PCAP forms right now. And I can't comment on any data in that area because, like I said, it's still new. And we're still trying to get those forms finalized for the program. Are you going to be um, assessing the effectiveness of those forms themselves and and that documentation and and is that information that could possibly be available 
to other communities? Yeah, once and the Penelope is actually going to be modified for our program. So the Penelope is, is, is developed right now specifically for the ASI, the biannuals, and um, to gather those kind of stats for pro PCAP programs. But because we're family-centered, we're taking the family-centered, um, we're taking the family farms out of that PCAP model, and we're going to modify them so that the, we'll, be, we'll be entering our data in a, into the Penelope, but with the family forms. So actually, Siksika is going to have the first um, modified PCAP. Penelope um, database kind of thing. I'm not saying it properly right now. I'm sorry, but we're going to be um, taking those family forms that Teresa has um, that has has developed for families and using those as assessments. So right now we're in the process of modifying them and getting them approved from Teresa and then getting the Penelope modified for the Sixaga Nation program. So I'm hoping that by next year we'll have better stats in that area and better information to provide on quality assurance within the with those forms. So if anyone needs to get a hold of us or anyone has any questions or anything else they'd like to add, um, this is our email, uh, my email address, and I'm free to answering anything anybody has. Sorry, I just wanted to add that um, since we were hit with the flood in June 21st, 2013, was it? Um, the difficulties to get to our clients is at least an hour and 15 minutes because of the bridge, which, you know, the, con the, the damage to the bridge. I forgot to add that. And like just for everybody to get a grasp on how far we have to travel, it's about, for my one of my clients, it's about 50 minutes. And then for Tyann's clients, it's an hour and 15 minutes. So that's pretty much how we our travel across the nation is. Like just for you guys to get an idea on that. Okay. Yeah, and that's one keynote we should have mentioned was that we're still dealing with the devastation of the flood that hit Siksika, and um, a lot of our programs had to pull together within the health center to provide services. So we kind of still, we're not on high, um, what was it, crisis anymore? Actually, we are right now. But um, we weren't for a while, and our programming, and a lot, we had about... I think seven families from our program that were affected by the flood that we had to provide support services for, additional and beyond support services for. And right now we're coming on the anniversary date, and with all the snow melting, it's causing chaos all over again. So it's been difficult providing our program along with what was going on within our nation. So thank you. Thank you for the presentation today and listening to us. I want to thank you very much, Vanessa and Michelle, for the great presentation. It was informative and inspiring to uh, hear about your work with the uh, Siksika Nation. And we appreciate you sharing your story with us so that we can learn and grow together. I want to remind you that evaluations will be uh, sent to you within the next two business days. And please um, be sure to sign up and, and fill out your feedback so that we can learn and grow. And I want to remind you that our next presentation is coming on May 21st, uh, 2014, with uh, Charlene Helson, who is the Mental Health Promotion Coordinator for the Aboriginal Health with Alberta Health Services. And her presentation, which is entitled Unpacking the Backpack, will discuss the role of historical trauma as an underlying cause for addiction and FASD in the Aboriginal community, as well as familial and cultural practices that can mitigate the trauma's effects. So once again, thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next learning series presentation.